And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who really wants a commemorative T-shirt. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, is it beautiful here today on the mainland. I'm not on Milleronia. Colonel Jeff and I are recording in, well, in The Larry Miller Show studio on the mainland here, and uh, it's just gorgeous, you know, and, uh, ah, oh, folks, it's, there's so many things to tell you. I mean, first of all, if, if you know, we, we I can tell you the way we celebrate Easter and Passover on Milleronia, and it's a wonderful ceremony, by the way, and uh, we keep them separate, even though probably that's, you know, it's the same holiday. I'll tell you about that uh, more a little later, but boy, oh, boy. It's just so gorgeous to be back here, and uh, as ever, that music makes me happy. Of course, that's the Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle Orchestra, and the Ann Ritterstein Dancers, featuring boy tenor Tabby Stone, asking the musical question, You know I'm a guy, right? Now, that, not surprisingly, that puzzled me for a second, and it puzzled Colonel Jeff, too, and then... Well, uh, Tabby says that, uh, and I believe him, you know, and so does Colonel Jeff, that he says, I mentioned him, I mentioned him a few weeks ago, uh, as a girl tenor, uh, cause that's the name Tabby Stone. But he says, he's not a girl, he's a boy. And, uh, hey, I buy that. And you know what, Tabby, I'm glad for you. And, uh, I'm sorry I made that mistake. It's a, I'll be honest, I'd like to know, let us know, by the way, send it to, you know, to our website. Let us know how you got the name Tabby. Is that like the Don Rickles song that, you know, how do you do, my name is Sue? And, uh, well, nothing's like that song, really, come to think of it. That's just a great song. But uh, let us know, Tabby. You know, you're not a girl, you're a boy. And maybe there's a story behind that name that I can say again, but I'm glad... Glad you wrote in, and I'm glad you let me know. And it's actually, you know who would who would make uh, that funny, by the way? He would make that very funny, because he could make anything very funny. The great Don Rickles. And you must know that uh, Don, God bless him, passed away a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we couldn't do a show last week because Colonel Jeff was back with his family, back in farm country in Pennsylvania where he's from, and they were celebrating Easter together. And Don Rickles, though, folks, I have to tell you, there are times, and I think you know I believe this, there are times to stop and smile and look up and say, God bless you, boy, oh boy, you were something else. And that man, Don Rickles, no one has ever been funnier than Don Rickles. I was just telling Colonel Jeff that I was on a plane uh, oh, this is about 10 years ago. And uh, Don Rickles was on in an interview on the on the screen on the plane, on all the screens on the plane. And everyone was uh, watching it at the same time. And he was being interviewed by uh, a young woman. And uh, she asked him about someone, a uh, uh, beautiful actress he had just worked with in something, in a movie or TV show. But the point is, Don, I've got the headphones on. And uh, Don uh, says to her, Terrific lady, wonderful, uh, very pretty. Of course, now she's downstairs in my basement going, ah, 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 and he just did one of those sounds he could do. And folks, I still don't even get it, but I howled just him doing that, doing which is one of those Rickles things. And I'm telling you, every single person on the plane howled with me, every single one. And I know that if I walked up or you walked up to all of them, and just say, hey, by the way, explain that to me. Why was that funny? There's no answer. It's funny because it's Don Rickles. And boy, oh boy, he could just say something. And when he 
put his two fingers on those seams of that ball and actually reared back and fired a fastball. Holy mackerel. No one was ever funnier than Don. And by the way, he's been called a lot. I'm sure you've read in his obituaries that, uh, well, the insult comic. You know, when everyone had always said that, you know, that's the Don Rickles, the insult comic. And he hated that phrase. He hated that name. And so do I. He said, you know, I'm not, I'm not an insult comic. I'm a comic. And he's right. He's exactly right. I never saw him as an insult comic. I'm telling you, I saw him as a guy when he, my dad, God bless him, used to, and my dad and I would stay up in the late 60s to watch him just if he was on The Tonight Show. Well, we'd watch it with Johnny, too, but uh, this was definite. That This was a must, talk about must-see TV. If Don Rickles was hosting The Tonight Show, holy mackerel, was he funny. And again, just being Don and turning to Ed McMahon, <laughs> the same thing. Ed, it's nice to see you. Of course, I know you're going home later. And, you know, and he would just do a drinking sound and emotion. And Ed laughed. The audience howled. I howled. My dad howled. We all just laughed. What a comic. And a great man. A great guy. A great giver to charities. Very generous. And... uh I ran into him a handful of times over the uh, over the years at the airport, and he'd be going somewhere, and I'd be going somewhere, and he was so sweet. He'd always come over and just say, uh, well, Larry, good to see you, you know, and, uh, and he had such a sweet smile and calm look, and I was thrilled to see him. I would always say, oh, boy, Don, it's great. Where are you going? Well, I'm going here, you know, and... Uh, where are you going? I said, oh, well, I'm going here and there. And uh, and then he would smile and he'd say, of course, sir, you know, once you get there, you got to, blah, 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 whatever he would say, he would toss a fastball in. And I howled. I would just uh, drop my luggage to laugh with Don. Not at Don, with Don. And no one ever wore a tuxedo better than that. I think I think you have to go with Frank Sinatra for who wore a tuxedo best. And But boy, oh boy, Don was from that school of you put on a good tux and you go out to entertain and you make people howl. By the way, one of the stories about Rickles, which is a true story, which was uh, which was uh, guaranteed, it was arranged by Frank Sinatra said it's a true story, that when Don was still a, well, a lounge comic in Las Vegas and people were really going to you know, getting to know him. I thought this would be 65 or 66 or something like that. And uh, uh, so he was out with a chorus girl at uh, dinner in uh, Las Vegas somewhere, and he sees Frank Sinatra is in the restaurant too. And uh, and everybody knew Rickles at that point, especially, well, all the all the big, big guys in Las Vegas. But uh, they'd never met in that... Uh, Don followed him into the bathroom, and he said, uh, Ah, Mr. Sinatra, I just want to say I'm sorry to bother you, but you know why uh, Sinatra's at the sink washing up? And he said, uh, Sinatra said, Oh, hiya, Don. And uh, and uh, Rickles said to him, Do me a favor. If if if, if you feel like it, this is, uh, uh, you know, the, this would really uh, help things. I'm out to dinner tonight. It's a first date with a chorus girl from the, you mentioned the hotel or whatever it is, and... Uh, if you if you feel like it, do me a favor. Just on your way out, just just stop by the table. Just walk by and just say, uh, "Oh, hi, Don. Good to see you." You know, it'd it'd make things a little fancier. You know, make things a little more official. And uh, Sinatra says to him, "You got a deal, Don." And uh, so he <laughs> Rickles. They both go back up. R Rickles sits back down again, and sure enough, in about five minutes, Sinatra walks by the table and says to him. Oh, hiya, Don. How you doing? And Rickles just looks up and says, Not now, Frank. I'm busy. <laughs> now, I don't know where you get... Uh, my dad used to say, you know, Could you uh, drop your pants for a second? Because they must be brass. And I want to see what a set like that looks like when it's brass. And uh, by the way, the story is... Uh, he says that he... I mean, he just dismisses Sinatra, Sinatra, you know. Not now, Frank, I'm busy. And he's Sinatra standing there, and, and this, 
Dennis Rickles and, and Sinatra confirmed it. After about two seconds, Sinatra starts to laugh. And he never laughed that hard in his life. He, he howled laughing at this thing Rickles just did and set him up on. Who does that? But Rickles did, and Sinatra loved it. But that's a heck of a story, isn't it, folks? I mean, good Lord. I mean, there are the great Sinatras. There's great stories about everyone, especially at that level. But boy, oh boy, everyone loved Rickles. Everyone I knew loved Rickles. And everyone would turn on anything if Rickles was on it. And whether we were on an airplane, just to laugh so hard at Rickles saying something, whether he would walk out on a stage, well, in Las Vegas, a big stage on a big, oh, in a big theater and a big, uh, in a big hotel. God bless him. He was great. He was 90 years old. There are so many things to tell. What, and they were best friends with Bob Newhart, by the way. They just loved each other for, forever, for all the decades of, of show business. And, uh, well, he's passed on now, but I feel absolutely, absolutely perfect looking up with a smile and saying, you know what? God bless you, Don. You're all right. And by Amazon and PayPal. That's right. Now, these companies, folks, these are worth knowing about. Amazon does something no other company on the planet Earth ever does. They do three things. One, order anything you want. You'll get it. Anything you want. Two, they already have it. They don't even have to send for it. They don't even have to make it. They don't have to borrow it. They already have it in that gigantic Amazon warehouse. It's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. They already have it. And three, one we love that's most important, they send a percentage of whatever you order here to the show. And uh, we put that money, uh, Colonel Jeff and I put that money right in a big steel box. And that's the money we save for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. The one we may, may, may invite Dr. Chris back on. We have for the last two years. And, uh, well, we, we love the guy anyway, but it's, it's, he's in a tough rut there. He's a tough in a tough groove. He's a clog dancing major for his doctorate in clog dancing at the University of Solvang. Solvang which is a real place, a real school. And uh, so you know what Amazon does? Every, oh, they're everything. You know what, folks? Give them a call, but don't give them a call. Let us give them a call. Because you know what? You can get on any machine you have, an iPhone and uh, anything with a screen on it, and get to Amazon. Don't do that. What you do is go to our website, Larry Miller Podcast. <laughs> I can't remember these things. How dumb can one get? Larry Miller Podcast dot com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> that sounds like something coming out of Don. Don Rickles, God bless him. But you know what? Uh, do that. Go to Larry Miller Podcast dot com. We have a banner that says Amazon. Click our banner. And you know what? We'll take you to Amazon. Click our banner and go take a nap. And Colonel Jeff, doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the night, if we're on the mainland or on Milleronia or some other secret place, which I'm building, by the way. I'm building another secret place. I just want a secret place. I can't tell you about it now. I couldn't tell you where it is because I can't tell you where Milleronia is. But we're building another secret place because I want one. Just a secret place. And you know what, folks, though? You click Amazon, we'll get you there. And by PayPal. That's right. This guy, I love this company because you know what? You work with them and it's, 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 you feel like you're saving the world. And who knows? Maybe you are. And, uh, PayPal is a terrific group. They have a banner on our website too. They have a banner. They have a PayPal banner. So go, go back to our website, which is, as you know, Larry Miller podcast. Dot com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Oh, boy. It's another sound that came out of Don. Or me. Or you. 
But in any case, do that. They're they're a great group there. Thanks to Amazon and thanks to PayPal. And uh, thank you folks in advance. If you're going to call and send money for us, uh, we appreciate it. It means the world. So thank you. And if you're thinking about it, thank you again. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. And I just realized it doesn't mean the week as in not strong. It means the week, like a seven-day week. The joke of the week. And I love this very much. As you know, I I love passing on a good joke. And I think you do too. There's nothing like a good joke to family or friends. And uh, I think this is a good one. <laughs> and so does Colonel Jeff. Uh, there's a guy and he's uh, he's 40 years old and he's not married. Never been married. And uh, his friend comes up to him in uh, their office one day there where they work and the friend says to him say what's with you bill you know what uh, how what, you know what's going on here how come you uh, you're not married yet uh, you, you did you never met any any young women you really really like and could spend your life with and then bill says I, I have in fact i've met i many uh, you know beautiful girls and i thought well let me uh, i could marry her and uh, but there's a you know it there's a problem because then I, when I bring her home to meet my folks, my mom never likes them, you know, that she just, she, she just doesn't. And that sort of wrecks it for me and, uh, for me and her. And I, so I, you know, I never ask her to marry me. And, uh, and, uh, well, his friend says to him, I've got the solution for that. I can fix that for you. And what you do first of all is next time you go out and you're looking, you see a woman sitting there and you want to say hello to her. Find a woman now who's exactly like your mom. She does everything the same way your mom does. And you know what? Now when you introduce her to your mom, that, uh, well, your mom's going to love her. And, uh, and, and every, so everything is wrong. Everything is better. And so you, you can marry her. So he says, Bill says, you know what? That actually sounds pretty good. A couple of months later, they run into each other at uh, the big baseball game. And uh, you know what? Uh, his friend comes up to him and says, so, Bill, you know, uh, what happened? Did you meet a nice girl there? And uh, Bill says to him, you know, I did. But uh, I'll tell you what. And then I took her home to meet my folks. And, uh, well, it all went wrong again. And uh, my mom was happy. My mom uh, loved her. And his, his friend said, well, what's the problem? And he says, my dad hated her. <laughs> That's a pretty good joke, isn't it? I didn't see that coming. Oh, now it's the other way. Yeah, she was too much like the mother, and the dad couldn't stand that. But that's a good one. I hope you like it, folks. And I hope you will, uh, well, pass that on. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show, The Poetry Corner. That string quartet is beautiful as always. It really moves me. And, uh, you know, folks, I think the guy coughing there may have just been, that may have been part of his reaction to a Don Rickles show. He's laughing so hard, he can't even breathe. God bless you, Don. This is a good poem, folks. I like this a lot. It's called Always Marry an April Girl by Ogden Nash, the great Ogden Nash. He is so wonderful. An American poet who was just uh, as clever, as warm, and as wonderful, and as good a wordsmith as anyone. And I thought that was a great title. Always Marry an April Girl. So here it is by Ogden Nash. Praise the spells and bless the charms. I found April in my arms. April, golden, April, cloudy, gracious, cruel, tender, rowdy. April, soft, in flowered languor. April, cold, with sudden anger. Ever-changing, ever-true. I love April. I love you. Isn't that nice? 
Goes to show you, boy, about poetry that sometimes long, sometimes short. But, oh, the soul and the wit of Ogden Nash and the warmth. Hmm. Ever-changing, ever-true, I love April, I love you. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. M-M-M, Triple M, the magic movie moment. Oh, folks, this is a good one. In fact, a terrific one. And, uh... Gee, it's been a while. I must tell you, though, this this means a lot, and you'll see why also later in the show. But uh, this is a movie called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo from 1944 in the middle of World War II, and there's a reason for that. This is about the what became instantly became the famous Doolittle Raiders movie. And this was written by, that was 80 Men Very Brave, who were, well, in the group, the fighting group of Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle. And that was, by the way, that was the 75th anniversary of that raid yesterday. And again, I'll tell you about that a little later, but this is very meaningful because it was a book written by Ted W. Lawson, who was one of the pilots There were 15 planes. They were the B-25, the Flying Fortresses, and they had never flown on a mission like this. And they were taking off of an aircraft carrier, and that had never been done. These planes had never been on an aircraft carrier. But that's where we were, and this is very important. Can you imagine just four, five months, four and a half months after Pearl Harbor and... President Roosevelt at the time said he wanted to, you know, before December was that, on the 21st of December, he got all his joint chiefs together and said, I want a mission that shows Japan who we are and that lifts the morale, not only of all our armed men and uh, in the field there and the ones training, but the whole country, men and women all across America. And you know what? Someone else in the Navy, had the idea, I'm sorry I don't have his name in front of me right now, of this as the mission. And it was a bombing raid over Tokyo, 30 seconds over Tokyo. Captain Ted Lawson, who wrote this book, lost his leg in that raid. And, well, he wrote this book, and what a movie it is, directed by Mervyn Leroy, written by Dalton Trumbo. And what a cast. Van Johnson as Ted Lawson, as the, uh, well, the pilot. Spencer Tracy, who played Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle. And uh, what a man he was. What a man they all were, folks. Great cast. Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Thaxter as Lawson's wife. Don DeFore. Oh, so many. Robert Walker. John R. Riley who played Shorty Manch. And by the way, that's one of those you just have to read. God bless him. I don't don't know who who John R. Riley was, and I'm I'm sure I know him from seeing him. But uh, great name, Shorty Manch. And you know what, folks? This is a wonderful movie. If you haven't seen it, please see it. And remember, this is the 75th anniversary of this. People never did things like this. There were never missions like this. And there was this one, though, four and a half months after Pearl Harbor. And they trained, they had these, oh, these planes, again, the B-25s had never taken off like this. But they planned it, and it was approved up to the top. And, well, the captain of the ship, the Hornet, was the name of the aircraft carrier. And, wow, the Hornet and... uh, by by the way, the ca- that was Captain Mark Mitcher, who was very well known then too. He was born in eighteen ninety seven, Captain Mitcher. And so by the time when they took off his aircraft carrier, that was in nineteen forty two. And well, that made him made him fifty five years old. Please look this up on the internet. 
Look it up under Doolittle Raiders. D-O-O-L-I-T-T-L-E Raiders. And you know why? Because it's so meaningful. It reminds you again, you and I don't remember things, folks. No one does. And we should remember more and we should learn more. And the point of mentioning this today is that this goes in two categories on the show. Well, Magic Movie Moment, there are so many in this great film, but I really just wanted to tell you about it because of the anniversary and because how deeply felt this mission was. Everyone, everyone thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened across the country, every headline, everything, every American, every every soldier, sailor, and pilot, and Marine, And by the way, remember, we didn't have the Air Force at that point yet. American forces didn't, there was no Air Force. So, well, Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle was in what they called the United States Army Air Force. That's what they called it for all all of World War II. Everything, all the bombing missions and all the fighter planes, everything over Europe and everything over Germany and into Germany and everything all over Japan. And folks, that's quite a mission they had on this. See the movie for that reason alone. Can you imagine that this took place in 1942? The mission was a startling success. It was really something. And they completely hit. Every plane had different targets. They were in Japan, all in Japan, all in and around Tokyo. And they were all... Well, making their fighter planes, making their tanks, making their all guns, making the, making everything for them. And the, the mission was a complete success. Each plane destroyed everything it hit. And then they, according to their plan, they turned west and went to China. And that was where they, the plan was to land, to go to China and get out there. But they didn't because they didn't make it. Because in those days, they didn't know what the what, what the gasoline would do. They didn't know anything, and they had to take off a little earlier, 650 miles from Japan. They were in the, in the Pacific on the Hornet, and they were spotted. That carrier was spotted by a bunch of boats who were Japanese fishermen. And they immediately, well, they saw an American aircraft carrier, and they radioed immediately back home, back to their bases there, that, hey, there's an American aircraft aircraft carrier. This was at 7.38 in the morning, and this was on the 18th of April in 1942. And as soon as... Well, as soon as Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle and Captain Mitcher saw that these boats were there, they started to escape in the boats and to run back. As soon as they saw that, they knew they had to move up 10 hours on their schedule because uh, once this news got back to Japan, they'd been in tremendous uh, tremendous trouble. And remember, they still didn't know how any of this was going, so they took off 10 hours earlier, which ate up more gasoline which they didn't understand anyway. So all of the men except one survived crash landings. Every single plane crash landed. They got into China, but not to where they were going. And just on the coast or just a mile in, they would parachute out and crash land or crash or the other way around, crash land and then just crawl out. But all of them, well, that's what caused Ted Lawson to lose a leg. And one of the, one of the fellows there, Factor, oh boy, his last name, he was, a, he was a corporal. And he was killed because he fell off a cliff, 1,300 feet high. He was the only uh, American on that mission. And by the way, I told uh, Colonel Jeff that there was another there was another American, one of the uh, navigators from another plane. He he landed because they parachuted down, and he grabbed the parachute and rolled it all up, and he rolled too. Everybody's rolling. Well, come on, you jump or dive out of a plane. 
which just barely reaches the China coast. And he he rolled there and uh, and uh, got his got his parachute together and was put, get, get, put pulling it in and wrapping it up. And then he just got a feeling he and then he, he turned around and looked, and he was two feet from the same cliff. And can you imagine that? They don't know where they are anyway. They don't know who's going to be there or what's going on. This is a great mission, folks, and a great time to have done it. And very meaningful for all of us, all Americans at the time, and, well, from President Roosevelt on down. And there is one Doolittle Raider left. He's the last one alive. And his name is Colt. And he's 101 years old. And he's the last one. So that's another good reason for you and for me to remember now and learn now. Look it up. I'm telling you, it's quite a thing. And, you know, at this time of the year, it's it's, it's, it's always funny to me because it's tax time, as you know, the same speaking of things that are celebrated in a way. But... It's amazing if you think about it because at tax time is always the same time of year, always the same day, but it still seems like a rush. Everyone's you and me, you got to rush into it, got to get things ready. And uh, well, on uh, it's, I'm on the mainland now and I'm, of course, I'm American. And uh, But on Milleronia, all taxes are collected by Ali Dungmeister Jr., so everyone has to go up, uh, you know, he's the master of the volcanoes. He's the volcano master, or the lava wrangler, as some call him. But Ali Dun- Dungmeister Jr. has to go up to his office on th- at the volcanoes, way up the mountains, to sign everything for their taxes. And, uh, but, you know, they, they well, they're terrified to go up there because... I can tell you, Ali Jr. is a great fella. Now, true, he looks a little, a bit like a Russian weightlifter, so he's got that that build, and he's in charge. You know, his his main job is, you know, well, people. The reason they're they're terrified to go up there, they know next time might not be voluntary. And uh, I'm telling you, the poor fella. Every so often, when Ali goes into a, a bar, for instance, back at street level. As you can imagine, the conversation drops and no one wants to talk to him. It's as if someone just said, hey, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And folks, Ollie notices and the bartender, you know, he says, oh, hi, uh, Ollie, good to see you. And the bartender's hands are shaking because he's nervous. Everyone's nervous about Ollie Dungmeister Jr. And well, there's a reason for that. We renamed the volcanoes, by the way, at tax time. And uh, Ali has a button he pushes under his desk. He calls it the Brimstone Audit. And, uh, well, it's quite a thing to see. I have seen it. And it's, uh, between you and me, it's a little upsetting because if someone doesn't give the right answers, someone talking to Ali about his taxes, well, the guy notices, everyone would notice, I notice, that Ali just reaches a hand under his desk and you see, well the muscles on his neck strain a little and and that shoulder move a little and uh that's where the button is the you know that's where he well he, the the brimstone audit and what happens as soon as he pushes that because people try at that point they say they know it's not going well and they they always say well, no no Ali wait wait forget that idea i just mentioned forget it i don't I, you know I'll, I'll pay whatever 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 it is but it's already over because he pushes that button, and someone flips out of that chair. The chair goes back on a huge hinge, and there's a there's well a door a, a trap door that opens behind the chair, and that guy flips out of the chair and right into that open hole, and the chair just rights itself, and it's like nothing ever happened. And the trap door closes, and you can always hear, by the way, because we have. Plastic slides, like uh, sliding pond slides, but they're in curves and they're in uh, circles. 
you can hear the guy sliding down and around that because everyone knows it dumps you right into volcano number one. But for some reason, it's fun along the way that you can hear once the guy starts sliding down, well, in circles there, you can hear him go, ooh, wee, it's a little soft because he's, because he's sliding away, wee, wee, and he's sliding through the volcano mountains and, uh, but you always hear, wee, and then eventually, oh, come on. <laughs> That's just before, of course. Well, he slides right into volcano number one. We don't have volcanoes here on the mainland. But if you don't pay your taxes, you know, they'll send a few fellows to your house. And they won't be unarmed. But there are two other things that come at the same time of year again. And they're very meaningful. We just had Easter and Passover, as you know. And folks, those are far closer than we think. I mean, all of us notice things. I hope you had a good, a great holiday. And, uh, but to think of, well, Easter is a very dramatic holiday. Just three days ago, you, you all know what happened, or you should. That was, uh, well, the crucifixion, and then an angel said something that was very, very dramatic and moving when uh, three days later on, well, Easter Sunday, they rolled the big stone wheel back out of a lot of the, well, a lot of the Jewish uh, cemeteries were like that. That's exactly how people were buried. They sort of have a stone hole and uh, it was like a little room or a little tunnel but very little and then the body was laying uh, the body was laid down in there and then uh, they all walked out and rolled a piece of stone a circular piece of stone in front of it and they came back to see it and the uh, they were there and rolled it over and uh, the angel walked in and said, he's not in here. Which is a very meaningful way to start a story. Well, look what it's brought, folks. And it's so interesting that Easter and Passover are so close to each other. Did you know the Last Supper? We all know the painting of the Last Supper. Well, it could be called the Last Seder. That's why they were there. I mean... They were all Jews. Jesus, of course, was a Jew and a rabbi, in fact. And they had that's what they were doing there. So by breaking that bread or passing it around, that well, that was matzah. That's what it was. And so I think it's, you know, it's 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 closer than ever. And it it's very moving to me. I and I think that's why it, it occurs at the same time of year. Good Lord, not just a tax time, but well, Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle's mission, and I keep saying that name completely because he deserves it. And you know what, folks? We don't. We not only remember that, and we should remember that, but I think we could all do with remembering Easter and Passover a little more than we do. It's not just time for a mattress sale. And, uh, well, maybe we'll all do that better next time. And uh, I said that to one of my kids, in fact. You know what? Uh, more next year. Let's do it more next year. And I hope the same for you folks. And you know that as much as I know it. And we know the same things. Homer is Homer and Pluto is a planet. So remember, as always... If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Just like Doolittle and his Raiders won. And just like Easter and Passover win. We'll see you here next time. <laughs>